When I was in college, I had a roommate from Australia, and being 9,000 miles away from home, he sometimes felt a little homesick, especially on his birthday. Back home on his birthday, he always got to choose what the family had for dinner, and he always chose the same thing, a dish he simply called favorite. So one year, he attempted to make favorite, in the little kitchen of our apartment, and it didn't go so well. You wouldn't understand unless you have experienced the taste of Vegemite. And if you haven't experienced Vegemite, be thankful. Anyway, today, as you have heard, is my birthday, my 48th birthday, as a matter of fact. And in honor of my college roommate, I decided that today I get to choose the scripture readings, my favorites. You may think that I always get to choose the scripture readings for the day, but that really isn't so because I'm very careful about following the lectionary passages for today, for the day. And some of these passages don't show up in the lectionary. So today is a real treat for me. And the passages tell tell a tale and the tale they tell reveals quite a bit about my basic understanding of the christian faith my view of life theology and living as a christian in the world today now i'm going to weave these passages together into my sermon rather than reading them all at once so hopefully you will enjoy this sermon But if you don't, don't worry, because my birthday doesn't come up again on a Sunday for another six years, and it's my favorite, not yours. So, here we go. I start with that which I believe to be the core of Christianity, church. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Church is the most basic essence of Christianity. More basic than a set of beliefs, more basic than the Bible, more basic than one's individual relationship to God or Jesus. Christianity is life as part of church. Of course, there are a lot of people who think of themselves as Christian who have nothing to do with church, and Christian they may be, but ultimately that identity is dependent on church. But if church is the most basic essence of Christianity, what is church? Well, look around. This is church. It's pretty much what you see here. It is us, as we together attempt to live for Jesus. Actually, it is, of course, not just us, but all those who through the ages and across the world have attempted together to live for Jesus. But little groups like this give meaning to the whole, and the whole across the world and across time exist in the local. Christianity is being part of this people who are trying to live for Jesus. Beliefs matter, certainly, because without them we could never agree on what it means to try to live for Jesus. The Bible matters because without it we could never keep the story alive of what Jesus was all about. Your personal relationship with God matters because trying to live for Jesus inevitably shapes your personal life. But all of those things come from, first of all, church, us, 
as we, together, attempt to live for Jesus. So for my birthday, I get to say gladly that it all begins with church. One of the things the church has discovered through the ages as we have attempted to live for Jesus is a particular view of being and non-being. And the second of my favorite passages reveals this message. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Saying God is light, of course, is another way of saying that God is good and that there is nothing in God that is not light. There is nothing in God that is not good. In God, it says, there is no darkness at all. And if God's entire being is light, is good, if there is no darkness in God at all, then that means that the creator of this universe is all light and good, and that means that there is only good in this universe. And this is an important part of the way I understand what Christianity and the world and our lives are all about. It's all good. It's all good, and it's all a gift, and it's all to be celebrated and marveled at from distant galaxies to bacteria, from poetry to baseball, from humor to curiosity, it's all good. But what about evil? Evil is not good, perhaps you ask. Indeed, evil is not good, and darkness is not light. But as the church we have learned through the years that there are helpful ways and unhelpful ways to talk about evil. We have learned to say that evil is the sheer absence of good, the absence of God. It is quite right, you see, for First John to use the imagery of light and darkness to talk about God, because Think about it. I mean, what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. We know what it is, and so we can talk about it. We can even fear it, but it is quite literally nothing. It has no being, no existence. And evil is the same. We know what it is, and we can talk about it, and we can even fear it, but it has no being, no existence. It has no power other than the power that comes from it not being good. The non-being of evil, the non-being of evil is so important to me because it is the ultimate sign of the goodness of creation and the goodness of God. At the heart of everything is light, goodness. And that's a wonderful thing. So on my birthday, I get to say gladly that it's all good. And the next passage is closely related to that, just more personal rather than cosmic. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, then the Lord God formed a human being from the dust of the ground, and breathed into the human being's nostrils the breath of life. And the human being became a living being. That God that I was just talking about, the God that is light, in whom there is no darkness at all, that God breathed life into us. 
That is not a comment on our biological creation, of course. It is a comment on what life is. Life is a gift, and that gift is the presence of God in us. Life is the presence of God in us. You know, I mean, just how cool is that? I mean, I, I, I didn't want you, I don't want you to take this all spiritualized, though. We are flesh and blood, not just some spark of the divine within us, because we are what we eat. We are ultimately dirt and water and sunlight, but filled with the breath of God. I may be 48 today, but I remember what it was like to be a child. As children, I think we have a better sense of ourselves as physical beings. It seems more like we are our bodies when we run and jump and roll and blink and laugh and cry and sing and sleep. And it seems like as we get older, we get a different sense of our personal identity and it somehow becomes separated from our bodies. But earlier, when younger, we just are our embodied self. And I think there are some ways in which that is a lot closer to the biblical view of human beings than what we commonly believe. For God formed us from the dust of the ground and breathed into us the breath of life. And don't forget, that is the God who is light and in whom there, in whom there is no darkness. And in that light and in that goodness is our life. And so on my birthday, I get to say gladly that life is good. Now, I think it's helpful, though, to think through what we really mean by the word good. To me, an important part of what good is is named by the word peace. Now, you all know that I'm a big peace guy, right? I believe that those who follow Christ cannot support the use of violence to try to do good, uh, that I support peace by being a vegetarian, that, properly speaking, as you have learned, that evil can only become overcome by good. Actually, to say that a little differently, that evil has no being and can only be overcome by filling that empty space with good. But you might be surprised to hear me say that one of the most important passages in Scripture for supporting my understanding of peace is this. Jesus said, The Father and I are one. Now, I know that connection is not self-evident, so let me explain. When we hear this passage, I think our attention immediately goes to that final word, the word one. Jesus was clearly making the significant theological claim that there is no separation between him and the Father. Now, and although I do not believe that God is male, I will follow the language of this package, passage and talk about the non-gender God as the Father. But our focus on the word one here can be misleading. For there are clearly two subjects in this sentence, the Father and Jesus. There may be no separation between Jesus and the Father, but that's not to say that there's no distinction between them. Indeed, for Jesus to be able to say that the Father and I are one, there must be a difference between them. There is a difference between them, and yet they are one. Or, to make my point here, there is a difference between them, and yet they are utterly at peace with each other. And that, I believe, is the foundation of all peace, according to the Christian faith. Difference is possible with peace. Difference 
need not be a source of fear or anxiety or competition and difference certainly need not be obliterated by violence. Difference is okay. Difference is good. Indeed, the greater insight of our faith is that real peace is only possible in the midst of welcomed difference. Peace is never mere uniformity. Uniformity of people or ideas or colors or identities or uniformity of anything is dull and lifeless. Still, uniformity is what we seek when we use violence to overcome difference. Uniformity is like a single tone playing without variance. On and on and on. But true peace, peace that exists not in spite of difference, but because of difference. True peace is a symphony. Or as you'll hear at the end of this service today, a Buxtehude fugue, or a really great U2 song. Instead of seeing difference as something that we welcome, we so often see it as a threat. And so we crush the distance between us. And therein lies the source of so much of our violence. But because Jesus and the Father are one, and even though Tyler is crying in spite of it, I embrace my difference with Tyler's cry. Even because Jesus, because Jesus and the Father are one, we can discover that distance between our difference is a gift and a blessing. So on my birthday, I can gladly say that the difference between us is peace. Now, given that I'm a pastor and I get up here each week to talk about the Bible and Jesus and the church and forgiveness and peace and all that other stuff that I've been going on about, you may think that I'm a big fan of religion. But actually, not so much. And this next passage reveals why. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. In this passage, Micah is not just proposing one way of serving God over another. Rather, Micah is overturning the very definition of what religion is, of what it means to be in relationship with God. With what shall I come on high before the Lord? With what shall I bow down before the Lord my God? In other words, what shall be the basis of my worship, of my relationship with God? Shall it be the stuff that I can offer to God, the ever-increasing, the ever-more-valuable stuff that I can offer to God? That's the basis of so much religion today, including very many versions of Christianity. Stuff that I can offer to God, for God must be appeased. God is angry or disappointed somehow, or in any case lacks something. So to get on God's good side, I'm going to provide that thing that God is lacking. That's religion. But Micah seeks to change all that. Micah says, phooey, forget all that. God doesn't need that. God lacks nothing. God is complete in and of God's self. Good, perfect, light, as we have heard. God lacks nothing. But God loves this world in which we live, and we, in response, want to love God. And if we do, we must pursue that which is truly good. Then we will pursue what God wants for this world. 
And so he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So on my birthday, I can gladly say that being a blessing to others is our relationship to God. And to follow that with a very similar theme, I read now another true favorite. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing fine clothes and say, hey, welcome, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, um, stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it that not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? Now, to get the real importance of this passage, you have to listen carefully to one of the first, to the, one of the words in the first verse. Believe. Do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? The actions discussed here are not about ethics or about morality or about being good or being faithful. These are actions about what we believe. If you do this, you don't believe in Jesus. Actions are belief. Now, I'm not sure who it is, but I know that I've seen the bumper sticker out there in the parking lot of this church, and so I know one of you has a bumper sticker that says, to believe is to care. And to care is to do. Exactly. And so on my birthday, I can gladly say that what we do shows what we truly believe. And now, finally, my last favorite, and maybe my favorite favorite, maybe the first among equals of my favorites. Early in the morning... Jesus came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. And from now on, do not sin again. Now, of course, the message of forgiveness that comes from this passage, 
is truly at the core of our faith. It is wonderful and touching and inspiring. If Jesus can forgive this woman, caught in the very act of adultery in a society in which that meant she deserved to be stoned to death, then there might be some hope for us in the midst of our various forms of unfaithfulness. And it just may even be able to inspire us to forgive others. But what I like even better in this passage is how Jesus goes about handling the situation, the way he improvises to bring about an incredible act of courage and love. And I believe this passage shows us that a large part of living the Christian faith in the world today, trying to be courageous in showing acts of love, is improvising. We have rules in this world. We even have the great rule of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And yet nothing can help us address every situation that comes up in life. Our lives, each one of us, are a wonderful myriad of difference. And we could never learn how to address every situation that we face and so we must learn, like Jesus, to improvise. Here he is faced in a situation, literally the imminent threat of death, a woman before him who may at any moment be stoned. And he sits down and begins to draw with a stick probably in the dust of the ground. And he stalls, and he comes up with a creative nonviolent way to embody God's love and save that woman's life. He improvises. He takes all he knows of what God is about in the world, all he knows of God's love and forgiveness and nonviolence and peace, and he takes all of it, and in that moment he comes up with the creative nonviolent response to a violent situation, and he teaches us a wonderful message of God's love, and he saves that woman's life. That's discipleship, my friends. That's courage. That's faithfulness. Improvising as the way to being a disciple of Jesus. And so, on my birthday, I get to say that being faithful to God is often a matter of improvising to do something courageous, courageous and full of love. And then, I know this has been long, but thank you for putting up with me on my birthday. I wrap it up all by saying, gladly, on my birthday, that it all begins with church, that it's all good, that life is good, that the difference between us is peace, that what we do shows what we truly believe, and that being faithful to God is a matter of improvising to do something courageous and full of love. And that is pretty much my view of this crazy little thing that we call Christianity. And that is my favorite. And it's a lot better than Vegemite casserole. <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.